Welcome to the class of 2028's presentation of learning. This expedition we have focused on World War I and its impact on people across the British Empire. Our guiding question in this expedition has been, do we honour all those who made a sacrifice in war? The expedition was broken into three case studies. The first was called the Call to Arms, where we focused on looking at why the war broke out and how the men were recruited. The second case study was called the Call to the Motherland, which focused on how the Empire countries were called upon to help the First World War and how the soldiers of different religions and their cultures were sacrificed and the effects it had on the soldiers in the trenches. The third case study was called The Call of Home and explored the lasting effect of the war and the effect on those who lost loved ones during the war. For our products, we have each written a piece of creative writing expressing our own hurt about in war. This evening, you will hear each student in C28 perform a radio broadcast mixed with our creative writing. It will highlight key moments leading up to and during World War I. There are tensions brewing across Europe. Two sides are currently forming as we speak. Russia, Britain and France are forming a triple entente, whereas Germany, Italy and Austria-Hungary are now a triple alliance. Where does this leave the British Empire? Well, I'm glad you asked, Holly. Britain has been readying itself for a situation just like this by forming alliances, deals that will give help if needed, and improving its own military powers. Turns out Germany has been a little jealous, haven't they? Indeed they have. Kaiser Wilhelm wanted to be bigger and better than the Empire. This led to the gradual build-up of tensions by starting an arms race. Both countries wanted the biggest and the best ships. They named these the Dreadnoughts. The constant urge to compete with each other across Europe is known as imperialism. Imperialist countries want to be strong, wealthy and powerful. Our neighbour France wants its land back from Germany, who they say stole it in 1871. Like most British folk, we are proud to be supportive of our country. This is what we call nationalism. The British press have been circulating rumours about an invasion on the motherland. Surely this cannot be true. Coming to you from XP School, we have some beautiful creative writing from students. It's early morning, the sun was peeking through the clouds. An eerie silence echoed across no man's land. I sit there in the cold empty field thinking of what I used to be. My leaves used to sing a chorus. Now I have no leaves left to sing. We interrupt this broadcast with the breaking news that Archduke Franz Ferdinand from Austria-Hungary has been assassinated by Gavilo Princip, who belongs to the Black Hand Gang, a Serbian secret military organisation. We are yet to know the consequences of this. Is war now inevitable? July 28, 1914. It's a month later, Austria-Hungary officially declared war on Serbia. As Russia is an ally, it has joined in on the side of Serbia. August 10, 1914. Breaking news. Austria-Hungary has invaded Russia. Britain declares war. Crowds can be seen cheering outside Buckingham Palace. However, there is a feeling of worry and anxiety amongst others across the country. The government have reassured us that the war will be over by Christmas. So let's take a closer look at Britain's position in Europe this year in 1914. Britain has tried to not get involved in the growing crisis in Europe. However, this seems to have all changed from late July of this year. The news of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand has been met with shock and surprise in Britain. And while the crisis between countries in Europe has been growing, British involvement has remained uncertain. Many people in Britain do not want to fight and believe that Britain should not get involved. The government is divided. In this broadcast, we pose the question, what should its involvement be? Does Britain need to protect its vast global empire and its sea trade? Should Britain fear Germany's domination of the continent and its challenge to British industrial and imperial supremacy? We know the British government has agreed to support Belgium if the Triple Alliance tries to violate its neutrality. Could this agreement have lasting consequences for Britain? Only time will tell. Newsflash, we interrupt this afternoon's broadcast to inform you that today, the 3rd of August 1914, Germany has just declared war on France. Update, Germany has demanded to take its troops through Belgium to get to France. Belgium has refused the request. Further update, Germany has invaded Belgium. At 2pm today, the 4th of August, Britain has issued an ultimatum demanding Germany withdraw its troops. Evening breaking news at 11pm today, 
The ultimatum deadline has passed without reply. Britain has officially declared war on Germany. Are our men prepared to join the cause? Well, it turns out not all. Our country is having to use many tools to encourage men to join up. The government has stated that propaganda has become a vital tool in the recruitment of men to fight. But what is propaganda? Well, propaganda is information that is designed to be especially biased and is often used to promote a political cause or point of view. So how is propaganda used in World War One? There have been various methods of propaganda used by Britain so far. Written forms of propaganda have been distributed by British media. This has ranged from books, leaflets, official publications, ministerial speeches to royal messages. Posters have been carefully designed. Some posters have been printed that make the army look exciting. Others have told men it's their duty to join, that they will feel proud if they do, or guilty and embarrassed if they don't join. Stories about bad things the Germans have done have been told to make people angry and frightened so everyone wants Britain to beat them in the war. Another widely recognised propaganda symbol at the moment is the white feather. It has, among other things, represented cowardice. It is aimed to shame men into enlisting in the British Army. Women have been persuaded to present men with a white feather if they are not wearing a uniform. I ran as fast as my little legs could carry me through the desolate lanes of the trenches, just avoiding a nearby landmine. I was ravenous, but I would not let my hunger defeat me. My head felt dizzy, and I thought it might be better if I just fell asleep. It's 1916 and conscription has been introduced in Britain. From the first two years of war, Britain has suffered heavy casualties. The British Army has found it difficult to replace these men. As a result of the government has no alternative but to increase numbers by introducing conscription compulsory active service. Parliament has been deeply divided on the issue but has recognised that because of the imminent collapse of moral of the French army, immediate action is essential. From January 1916 onwards, the Military Service Act will be passed. All single men aged between 18 and 41, except the medically unfit, clergymen, teachers and certain classes of the industrial workers will be called upon to fight. We are, we are seeing some people who are conscientious objectors. Many who are objects to fighting on more grounds, who are also exempt and in most cases will be given civilian jobs or non-fighting roles at the front. Britain called upon its empire at the very start of World War I. Britain's colonies have sent over two and a half million men to fight for Britain. So far, India has sent the most soldiers. Colonies as far as well as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and Rhodesia, which now Zimbabwe, have also sent thousands of soldiers. This has meant that Britain has troops from five different continents fighting for the motherland. Multiple countries and soldiers of religions and faith have now joined the British effort. A number of Sikh soldiers have just joined the effort. They believe in one god called Wahegru, which means Wonderful Lord or Wonderful Teacher. In World War I, Indian troops started arriving on the Western Front from September 1914. Sikh soldiers fought bravely and played a crucial role in the First Battle of Yeeps. Over one and a half million Indian soldiers had gone to support the effort on the front line. I was coming to the end of my shift. I sat at a desk and got out my paper and pen. I sincerely started to explain the incident. I put it in an envelope and wrote the name of the soldier's wife and the address. I sealed it with grief and reluctantly sent it off in the post with a heavy burden to bear. It is in November 1916. The Battle of Somme has just finished. The offensive began on the 1st of July 1916 after a week-long artillery bombardment of the German trenches. However, this bombardment was not as successful and advancing British troops found that the German defences were not being destroyed as expected. This has resulted in many units suffering very high casualties. By the end of the first day on the 1st of July 1916, British forces reported we had suffered 57,470 casualties, of whom 19,240 were killed. This clearly represents the largest losses suffered by the British Army in a single day. We are having to bring this news to you on this day. We can now report that both sides have suffered casualties of at least a million men. The devastating sight of these filthy waterways. Most of the people who stay here die after a couple of days of being in this place. The squeaking, shouting and yelling irritates me. Every single day I have to go through with it. 
It is hard to live in the trench. Hard is an understating. It is barbaric. Newsflash, today's date is November 11th, 1918. We are relieved to share the news with you that Germany has formally surrendered. All nations have agreed to stop fighting while the terms of peace are negotiated. Today's evening news bulletin on the 28th of June, 1919. Germany and the Allied nations have signed the Treaty of Versailles, formally ending the Great War. Thank you for listening to our presentation of learning.